Hi, I'm Becky Mayer and welcome to Transitions Body, Mind, Spirit. Transitions, we all make different transitions in our life. Uh, I do triathlons and uh, that's the perfect metaphor for life. First you in a triathlon you uh, get in the swim and then after you swim you transition again and get on that bicycle. And after you bicycle then you transition again and start to run. And that is just a great metaphor for what we do in our lives. Uh, I also, uh, when we're talking about the water, I go underneath the water. And we have a guest who's going to speak about that. We have our guest, Rob Harris. Thank you for being here, Rob. Thank you, Becky, for having me. Rob owns, uh, gee, I just blanked on it, Island Hoppers Scuba. Scuba. Mm -hmm. Island Hoppers Scuba. And uh, tell us a little bit, now he's gonna be demonstrating about our, about the equipment and all, but we wanna know more about your life, how you transition from one thing to another to another. And so tell us about w what you first started out as in high school and college and what you wanted to be. Or, and go ahead. Oh, wow. Uh, going out into college, I really wanted to get into engineering. In fact, I studied electromechanical engineering to get started with and then worked in that field for many years. Um, really enjoyed it. It was wonderful. And then on a lark, getting ready to go on a trip, I saw a guy that was offering scuba lessons. And I had flashbacks to my youth in the days of Sea Hunt. Sea Hunt. And the James Bond underwater scenes and Jacques Cousteau. It all kind of came flowing. I was like, yeah, I want to try this. And I signed up and I gave it a shot and I was just absolutely sold on it. I was addicted. I have that addictive personality. <laughs> and I jumped in with both feet. Um, wow, and how old were you? I was 26, 27 when I tried it the first okay. time. All I right. really wish I'd done it earlier. I'm so jealous now of kids that get to start when they're 10 and 12 years old. Mm. Uh, I started later in life, and, but I didn't stop. Every weekend after that, I never stopped. I kept going every weekend, every weekend, every weekend, and kept increasing my training. Uh, finally reached the point that I was right there getting close to being an instructor, and uh, my mentor in this kind of encouraged me down that path, yeah, go try it. So uh, I went ahead and did the instructor certification. It wasn't that hard. Actually, it's really easy to scuba dive. It's easier than most people think it is. Hmm. Um, but I got my instructor's license, went on about that route, still working my regular job in the engineering field, and then scuba diving on the weekends. And where was this? This was here in town, here in Nashville, Tennessee. And where did you dive in Nashville, Tennessee? Oh, we didn't dive here in Nashville that much back then. Most of what we did was in the Panhandle of Florida. We did, we were in, Panama City or Destin just about every weekend wow. doing drives. Okay, wow. And so then you got your instructor's license. You, it just kind of happened naturally? Just kind of happened naturally with the encouragement from my original instructor. Mm -hmm. And then I started teaching on the weekends and then uh, eventually had some needed to shop for an extra person. And that's when I had to make that change, that transition. transition for myself. You know, do I keep doing what I really enjoyed, what I wanted to do or do what I loved? and I chose to do what I loved because I love sharing the experience of scuba with mm. everybody. I found out later in life that I enjoy teaching and sharing more than anything and I enjoy doing it more with scuba than anything else. Mm. Wow, wow, so you ended up going, okay, I'm gonna leave my day job and work at a scuba place? Yes, and that was a big jump. That's To huge. go from the safety, the security to Standing alone on your own two feet, even working for somebody else, it was still a, it was scary a moment. Right, and I imagine the pay might have been a little different. Oh, yeah, it was quite a bit less. <laughs> That's but no, no but you chose something that you loved to do and felt called to do. Right. And scuba was it. Scuba was it. Wow, wow. So tell us then, how did that transfer to eventually you opening your own shop and? Uh, your shop is in Berry Hill in Nashville, Tennessee. It's wonderful. Been there, mm -hmm. done that. It's great. Well, I've definitely had a varied life in scuba. There's no doubt about it. I started out working for the gentleman who got me started. Mm -hmm. And uh, we worked together for about six or seven years and came to a party in other ways. Mm -hmm. And I opened my first scuba store. Is what you know, I've had two of them actually. Hmm. Uh, a place called Scuba Depot was over on Trousdale Drive. And it was a very small store, open on a very limited budget. 
and we did that for about six more years. Wow. Uh, then I had another small transition in my life. I had a, my youngest daughter was born, and at that point in our lives, me and my wife chose to take that next year off, and we did. We took a, the next several months off and almost the next nine months off and spent raising her. It's probably one of the best years of my life outside of scuba. Wow, so um, did you close the shop? We closed it. We shut it down and spent the first next year with her. It was absolutely amazing. So it was, you devoted a year to child rearing. Right, devoted Good a year for, for child rearing. Then for a short time, I put that engineering degree back to work to, for security to get her started. And as soon as she started into kindergarten, I looked at my and said, I've had enough, I'm going back to scuba. And then that's when Island Hopper Scuba came about. I see, wow. Wow, and so didn't you say the total of your years of scuba diving is uh, at least, what, 26 years? 26 years, I got certified back in 1988 and kept mm. going since then. Wow, that's fabulous. Well, I wanted the folks out there who maybe know nothing about scuba diving, and I uh, had the opportunity uh, a couple months ago to go diving with Rob, with a bunch of folks uh, to Fiji, which was absolutely fabulous. In fact, I am wearing earrings from my sweetie pie, Kirk Jones. These are uh, shark teeth from the island of Fiji. And I wanted people to know that uh, what the equipment is, and it's, like you say, it's really fairly easy to learn, and, it, uh, and you all do it so well. Could you kind of explain? We have this wonderful equipment here, um, and maybe you can tell us about it. Okay, absolutely. There's two basic parts for people getting started in the equipment. We call your snorkeling equipment and then your scuba equipment. Snorkeling. And with that snorkeling equipment, whether you're diving or not, you absolutely love snorkeling. But it's actually almost just as important as what you call your scuba equipment. Uh, because if you're snorkeling equipment, what could be your mask and your snorkel and your fins. If these don't fit properly, if they're uncomfortable, uh, if they're binding, twisting on your feet, or if your mask is leaking water while you're underneath the water, you're not gonna enjoy this at all. Okay. And that's one of the biggest problems I see that people have is they end up with a real inexpensive set of equipment that doesn't, that's not fitted to them. They just buy it off the shelf in a bag and put it on and go snorkeling. Mm -hmm. And then they get blisters or their mask is leaking. They don't enjoy it. Mm -hmm. That's why it's very important to get fitted for it so that you get the most out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're, if you're, can't see anything because your mask is flooded, you're not having all the fun you can down there. Um, people always ask me, you know, what can you expect to spend for a good set of equipment? It varies depending upon your needs. There are a, definitely a wide range of equipment. But a basic set, you can get started for as little as 90 to $150. You wanna go to a high end set, more like what we've got example here, you're gonna spend around $450 mm -hmm. for a good set of equipment. But here again, it doesn't matter what the dollar amount is that you spend, it's whether it fits you or not. Right. And that's why it's worth taking the time to get fitted properly for it. Right. Yeah, yeah. so this is for snorkeling. Right, this would be your snorkeling and setup. tell people, snorkeling is what? Snorkeling is actually swimming around on the surface of the ocean with your mask on and your breathing tube and your snorkel so that you can keep your face in the water and continue breathing. And this has been a very popular one for us because this is actually a dry snorkel. It never lets any water down the tube. And a lot of people talk about that. They all are snorkeling, they choked on the water. This doesn't let that happen. Mm. It's absolutely wonderful, mm -hmm. okay? And then some snorkeling down, actually diving down a little bit using your fin power to go down. Mm -hmm. And this is the same equipment that you use to go scuba diving. This is a, a, you have to have this to be able to see why you're down there. So you start with your basics, okay? When people sign up for our classes, we ask that they do have their own and come in and get fitted for them mm -hmm. so that they make sure they enjoy the experience, mm -hmm. okay? And then from there, we introduce them into the scuba equipment side of it. So to take a lesson, as somebody who is just beginning and they want to, you know, okay, I want to learn to scuba dive, how long will it take them to get their first certification, which allows them to go out and uh, dive? Right, their beginning certification, very easy. That was so much easier than what it was in the old days. When I first did it, this was a 40-hour program of academics and pool dives, then what they call open water training dives. With today's media that's available, you spend one weekend of academic and pool work with us there at the store. It's eight to six Saturday and Sunday. And then you have one more weekend of what we call open water training dives. We're actually diving in a local environment where you get to apply the skills and the knowledge that you learned in class while diving around and having fun. Now, when I got started, we all did it down in Destin. 
Now we dial all of the local stores are diving in a place called Penny Royal Scuba Resort, which is up in Hopkinsville, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. It's actually an old rock quarry. They've converted over. They've cleaned it up. They've put in bathhouses and pavilions, mm -hmm. and then underneath the water, this is what's amazing. They've got school buses, motorcycles, Huey helicopters, a big RV. Huey they just sank a new sailboat last weekend. Oh. It's absolutely a blast to go play around and incredible oh. visibility. It's a great training destination. So how deep does that go, that quarry? The, main, the mean depth that we train in is in the 25 to 30 foot area. There mm -hmm. are deeper areas out there. You can get down to 150, 160 feet inside of there. Huh. I ne never thought of uh, being in a quarry that interesting, but you're saying it, it just locally you can see things and old old boats or old motorcycles? Or? Absolutely. I mean, you can go sit down on the old Kawasaki and get your picture made as you're straddling the motorcycle, <laughs> uh, swimming through the RV while it's underneath the water. It's a wonderful experience out huh. there. Wow. And that trains you for when you're going to go out and see a World War II wreck or something. Absolutely. We do our basic training here to get us ready to go out to the ocean. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. So there, there you are, you've taken the course, and then there is that checkout dive, the final thing. Yes, the second weekend is those checkout dives. And it's, it's four dives, they're very easy. Mm -hmm. uh, each dive lasts about 20 to 30 minutes. The beginning of each dive, you'll repeat a few of the skills that you learned in the pool. And that's actually to get you comfortable. It's not really a test, but it's to get you reacclimated. Okay, here's your comfort level, here's your baseline. Now, we've done that, let's go play and have fun. And we get you acclimated to diving in something other than a swimming pool. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, okay, all right. And then, okay, so you, uh, can you explain more about the this equipment Absolutely. here? Which is, that's so not the snor, uh, we, let's say we know about our snorkeling, now it's the next step. All right, so when we go to scuba, we spend a lot of time learning this equipment in the classes. This is what the, the classes is all about. It's actually made up of three different parts, okay? This is an assembled unit that you see here. You've got, your scuba tank in the back, okay? On, attached to that scuba tank is a jacket, what we call a buoyancy control device or a buoyancy control jacket, okay? And then atop to the top of it is what we call a regulator system, which has four separate hoses coming off of it. We're gonna explain those in just a second. The function of the jacket is to kind of hold everything together. It also gives you positive buoyancy. It's a jacket, it's a big balloon. So if you ever felt mm. uncomfortable, you can actually swim to the surface and inflate your jacket and float on the surface. Mm -hmm. But it's also a wonderful thing underneath the water because underneath the water, once you learn in class how to control your buoyancy down there, you can actually become weightless underneath the water. So the, that scuba diving, when you're doing it right, it is as close as you can get to being in outer space without actually having to go there. Outer space, yeah. Yes, it absolutely so fits inner space. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, and that's what the jacket does. It kind of keeps everything together. It holds the tank and we attach our hoses from the regulator system to it. This regulator system has one hose that actually hooks up to the jacket so that you can inflate it underneath the water to keep yourself neutral or make yourself positively buoyant on the surface, okay? Also on the left-hand side of here, this is one thing that's really nice, is you've got a set of gauges, okay? Mm -hmm. So you can always tell at any time how much air you got left, okay? So you're never gonna run out as long as you watch this gauge and keep it going. Another new advent for us, when I used to watch Jacques Cousteau, they always talked about decompression sickness in the bins. This doesn't prevent it, but it actually helps prevent it. This is a dive computer. It actually tracks your depth, your time, and your nitrogen under the water to make diving safer. And then on the back side of it, it's got your compass, so that when you are diving some places and you want to make sure you get to the right destination, you can use your compass to get there. Mm -hmm. And on the right-hand side, always on the right, are what we call <coughs> your second stage regulators, okay? There's always two of them. There's, these are what you'll breathe off underneath the water. This is your life support equipment. Mm -hmm. One is for you to breathe off of, okay? The second one over here, this is what we call an alternate air source. It's there as safety, because we never dive alone. I always dive with a buddy. And just in case your buddy didn't watch their air supply, this is there for them if they run low on or out of air. So if we were diving together and you ran a little bit low, I could say, you could come to me, tell me, using one of the hand signals we learned in class, that I'm low on air, and I'll just hand you over this regulator, you put it in and start breathing, and we'll make our ascent up to the surface. It's actually a safety device. Mm -hmm. um, the, the safety side of scuba is actually amazing with the redundancy of the equipment, the backup regulator systems, uh, the dive computers, the buoyancy jackets, it's just become so safe overall. In fact, 
the studies that the industry tells us is that you're actually safer scuba diving than you are bowling. No, <laughs> than you are bowling? You're more likely to get hurt bowling than you are scuba diving. <laughs> wow, that's a comparison. Yeah, wow. how's that for you? Wow. Oh, well, that's that's wonderful to know about this equipment. And of course, when uh, when I went to uh, Fiji, I hadn't purchased equipment yet. So other than uh, mask. Uh, so when you go to a uh, place, sometimes you can rent equipment too until you're ready to purchase, right? Absolutely, you can. You can absolutely <coughs> rent it just about any place you want to go. Um, there's nothing wrong with doing that. And it's actually some great way to, it's a great way to travel and do. We do encourage people to have their own. Um, a good analogy for having your own scuba equipment and being certified is kind of like you get certified to drive and you get your driver's license, okay? And then every day you go out and you rent a car to drive back and forth to work wherever you gotta go. And every day you've gotta relearn how, where the shifter is, how to turn on your high beams, how to turn your lights on or the windshield wiper. So it breeds from, you know, you're not as familiar every day. Every day you're having to relearn it. The same thing comes with this, with life support equipment, it's better, it's, it's in your best interest for it to be automatic, you know, how to inflate the jacket, where the weight systems are at, or how to find your alternate air source should you drop it. It's the familiarity that breeds the safety into it. Mm. And they generally find overall that people that do have their own scuba equipment, their BCD and regular system, are actually less likely to have problems while diving. I, I totally agree. Yeah. And when you look at what you can get into it for, like I said, you rented it on the last trip, a, a set of equipment will last you a lifetime. Right. And depending on what you want, uh, you can get packages starting for as, you know, a little bit under $1,000. To You can get the absolute best top of the line equipment out there for three to 4,000, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. So you've got a wide range and a budget to work within. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's definitely different options for everybody out there yeah. to get into scuba. Well, the exciting part is, let's say, all right, you, you um, you bought your equipment, you're ready to go, it's just a, an exotic place. And the, the cool thing when you go in your shop, you can see all these walls of trips two years out. And how about naming some of the exotic, wonderful places that uh, groups go? Right, well, what we found in years ago is a lot of people like to dive, and they were dish diving locally, and they wanted to go and do it more, but they didn't know how to do it. So we started do, putting together organized group trips. And that's the board that you're talking about there. Uh, it's been a crazy travel year for us this year. We've done, uh, started out with Thailand earlier in the year. So where? Thailand. Thailand. And then we did some trips to Bonaire, which is off the northern coast of Venezuela. We did Grand Cayman. We've been to Cuba this year. That Cuba? was a very exciting, yes. Cuba? We went to Cuba earlier this year. Was that, it, that just happened, right? I mean, Cuba, uh, you couldn't even go there. Well, you've been able to go there for years. It's still not technically open yet. You still have to go a part of what they call a people to people or an exchange program. Right. And that's what we were doing. This was one of the first ones that was available for people to go do the exchanges and go scuba diving. Uh, uh, so that was one of the, actually we were on about the third trip out that was available to do that for Americans to be able to go and, and visit And was it Cuba. worth going? It was absolutely phenomenal. The diving was really good? The diving was absolutely pristine. The area we dove in on the south side of Cuba is pretty much untouched. Wow, um, I never thought about Cuba. Such as you saw when we were in Fiji, you know, they were having to feed the sharks to get them to come in close to us, okay? They actually had to pull the, in Cuba, they haven't seen divers before. And we jump in the water and they're swimming with us to check us out the whole dive. It almost got to the point by the end of the, your first two or three dives, you were tired of seeing the sharks. They were almost an annoyance. It's like, <laughs> go away. Um, so, wow, it was absolutely wonderful. Then we got other trips coming up. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to Palau. Uh, which Palau is in the South is Pacific, is will South be there um, next January, and then we're going into Indonesia next October. So we travel pretty much the world. We try to keep it interesting. Mm -hmm. And the neat thing too is uh, you have a core, uh, I guess, group from mostly Middle Tennessee that will go on these trips together, mm -hmm. and then they go on another trip a year from then, and they kind of know each other from the last trip. And there's a yeah, uh, you have a great way of uh, making community by having parties. You have a Halloween party coming up. Yeah. You can get to know other people and intermix and yeah. trade stories. In fact, we're going to have two guests that I met from Fiji uh, who will also be talking about their Fiji dive with the sharks. Yes. But that's another program. <laughs> yes, that is true. Yes, so divers, that's the other thing that's fun about divers. We're a very social group. We're very talkative. 
part of the reason is because we're underneath the water. There's not much talking going on. We've got hand signals we use, but then everybody gets back up on the boat and we're all so excited about the shark we saw or the seahorse we just, red seahorse we just saw last week or the yellow frogfish or the giant manta ray that was schooling around us. And everybody's talking and sharing on that boat and that sharing of experiences breeds friendships and relationships. Mm -hmm. And it just kind of grows and you see how divers overall by nature that we can't talk underneath the water and we have to talk afterwards and we're all so excited about it, it becomes a very uh, social group. Mm -hmm. And then I know you sent us some pictures which we are going to be showing either in the credits or sometime during our show here, uh, some amazing pictures that you took. Mm -hmm. And that's another side of, of scuba diving. It's not only you're experiencing it, but you're documenting it with cameras, with um, videos. Right. And do you teach people how to use that too? Yes, we do. We do offer lessons. In fact, when people get started with scuba, that initial certification is kind of like getting the learner's permit. There's levels of certification available, so you can kind of grow in the sport if you want to. Mm -hmm. uh, to we've kind of uh, borrowed a term from the, called we call it the black belt of scuba diving, where it represents somebody who's attained to different levels and reached certain levels in scuba diving. Wow. Uh, and then get up to, be the, to being an instructor like what I did. But we also offer the specialty certifications such as the underwater photography. Mm -hmm. uh, we do deep diver, wreck diver. We even do a lot of naturalist programs such as coral reef conservation or project aware or even shark awareness, one that you'd probably love doing. But now that you've actually got to go out and play with the sharks a little bit to learn actually more about those creatures. Because there's so much to do while diving. Uh, people, everybody finds something different they like to do. Such as your two guests that are coming on the next show. Brian really loves videography. It's one of his passions, and Howard is an incredible photographer. You're going to really enjoy what they're going to bring to the show for you. Yeah. But then I've got other customers that uh, they love wreck diving. Uh, right. In fact, we're planning a trip for them to go off to a place called Truck Lagoon in the South Pacific to dive uh, some Japanese ships that were sunk during World War II. Wow. Will you be on that also? I will probably be on that trip. Yes. Wow. And. Uh, I'd rather see the, personally, I'd, I'm uh, more of the, I'd rather see the fish and the, the wildlife mm -hmm. than the the di the the, uh, the wrecks, but I don't know. Well, the maybe. wrecks are pretty incredible because they've been uh, claimed by the fish and the wildlife. You're down there and you're seeing old Japanese tanks that are grown over with corals and sponges mm. and anemones. And it's, a, it's, it's amazing the way they've basically owned that area now. Mm -hmm. The fish are really taking it over. Mm -hmm. And I, I was just thinking that uh, if, if somebody uh, wants to travel as a couple, but mm -hmm. one doesn't dive, I was amazed by uh, the number of people that went to Fiji um, and they had spouses that didn't dive, but the spouses still had a good time, oh, know, our partners. Absolutely, we have that a lot, uh, where one person in the situation dives and the other one maybe snorkels or even doesn't snorkel at all, and they still have a great time. Because mm -hmm. when you put diver, you put them in with a bunch of divers who's that social creature again, mm -hmm. we just suck them right into us. Uh, <laughs> we bring them in, we make them a part of all the fun. We don't let them miss out on anything. Right, so they'll know what, what's going on. Yeah. Wow. Well, for somebody out there who is, who, who's just kind of, maybe you peak their, this show has piqued their interest, mm -hmm. what's the first step for them? The first step is actually coming in and giving it a try out. Try that initial lesson. Come by the shop and definitely come meet them. There's, you want to come meet the staff, okay, Cello, because personalities do go a long way into it. Mm -hmm. Me and you, Becky, we get along. Mm -hmm. But there's some people that come in that may not like me or may like one of the other instructors better and kind of want to pick your instructor, okay? Go to the facility that you're looking at doing it at and mm -hmm. make sure it fits your personality. Mm -hmm. Okay, because there are different options out there. Then sign up for your lessons. Okay, mm -hmm. we do have every so often somebody that tries it in the pool and says, "Ah, this just isn't for me." That's fine. Mm -hmm. It's not for everybody, mm -hmm. uh, but most people are amazed that they can do it because very few people have ever dropped out in, like I say, 26 years of doing this. A little bit over three to five thousand students. I've probably only had five or six people that decided it just wasn't for them. Wow! Wow! Yeah. Yeah, well, I'd, and certainly invite the world out there to, to try it. And the, it is so amazing to be underneath, to be face-to-face -face with these um, magnificent corals and fish and, 
it just opens up your your whole um, consciousness of what's out there. Oh, it's amazing because think about it. If you just live on land, you're only experiencing about 20% of what the world has to offer because 80% of what's available on this planet is underneath the surface of the water. Wow. So if you think the forest and it's amazing and everything you see out west is incredible and going to the mountains is phenomenal, mm -hmm. way do you go underneath the water? There's like just so much more to experience. The next frontier, yes. Mm -hmm. Wow. Golly. Wow. So what's next for you? What's the next trips going on for you personally? And is there any uh, bucket list places that you, ha you haven't been to that you want to go to? Well, Havana, going to Cuba was one of the big bucket list trips for me. Wow. That was amazing. Um, I've got the Palau trip coming up. Uh, the trip to Indonesia that we have coming up for next October, I'm really excited about. I really enjoy taking pictures underneath the water, doing mm -hmm. photography. Mm -hmm. And I really enjoy the little stuff down there, such as the nudibranchs or the mandarin fish, which are real tiny creatures, but no, are very no. beautiful. This tiny? Yes, ma'am, yeah. that's tiny. <laughs> and we're, that's the beauty of where we're going to, is a place called Limbe. Uh, it's full of all those neat, unusual creatures that you'll see in some of the pictures that mm -hmm. you'll be showing. And, and I think the public also oftentimes forgets, they think of the great big sharks and the big fish, but there's all these really magnificent little bitty fish that are so cool. Oh, it's absolutely amazing. There's, there's no doubt, it's phenomenal to have the humpback whale come swimming past or to have a 24-foot manta ray schooling and swimming around you. Uh, they have, you'll see some, some of the pictures that I sent you. It's phenomenal, mm -hmm. but there's so much more down there. And most of it's down on the bottom. Wow. Yeah. wow. Well, Rob Harris, thank you. Now, tell everybody where your shop is exactly so they'll know. And do you have a website they can get on? Yes. Uh, we're at Island Hopper Scuba, which is at 2806 Bransford Avenue over in South Nashville. And our website is www.islandhopperscuba.com. All right. Well, Rob, thank you for being in Transitions. You're a perfect example of Transitions. And thank you very much, Transitions, Body, Mind, Spirit. Thank you. We're going to show a lot of the pictures because we have a few more seconds. <laughs>